Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Tardy, and today on the show we have Tom Gimble. I'm really excited. He owns a company called LaSalle Network. You can check it out at LaSalleNetwork.com. And he also, I asked him how I should refer to him, and he said Supreme Commander of the World, which I should totally call you. If you were that, I bow down to you, sir. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Glad to be with you. So I was checking out your website. Give everybody a, a down low on what the company does. So LaSalle Network is a staffing and recruiting firm, meaning temporary and contract staffing as well as permanent search that we're headquartered in Chicago. And now, as of about a year ago, we're doing searches in about 12 major metropolitan areas across the country. And we also have an office in San Francisco doing placement in placing accountants, financial professionals, technology, HR, marketing, admin, call centers. So most mostly white collar office positions. So you are ridiculously good with your processes and systems of hiring people and getting the right fit, right? I really want to dive into that today. Um, What have you found, especially for a small business, right? Someone who's doing their first, second, third, fifth hire, something like that. What have you found are some really great tips on hiring, especially from someone that probably doesn't know how to hire well yet? I think there's there's two that I, I try to live by. And I think the smaller you are, I wish I would have known them back then is number one, you need to like the person that you hire. (laughs) You need to genuinely like the person that you hire. Secondly, you need to hold them accountable. Okay. So usually when you like people, you don't hold them accountable, right? When you don't like them, you do hold them accountable because you want a reason to fire them. So it's really, it's a, it's a reverse on that kind of thing. But I'd say those are the two big things is don't wait until they screw something up to start holding them accountable, hold them accountable from day one, Tell them that's your management style and simultaneously make sure you like them. I l- I've never heard it said in that. That's awesome. How do we hold them accountable, though, especially for an entrepreneur type? Because I work with entrepreneurs, right? And sometimes they're all over the place. They're not great with processes and check lo- checklists and stuff like that. How do we hold them accountable? Well, I think that's a, uh, a cop out that entrepreneurs <laughs> say. Right? Oh, I'm an entrepreneur. So, ah. <laughs> It's like, come on, cut the cut the BS and let's focus on this thing is you've got a skill set that you need to learn in order to grow your business. And it may not be your strength, but it doesn't have to be an absolute weakness. And so know what you want out of somebody. Be able to write down on a piece of paper, be able to type it out on a Word doc, whatever the case is, and say, if this exists in the first 30 days, six months, a year, I will be happy with this person. I expect them to do a, B, and C on a daily, weekly basis. If you want a weekly or a daily email summary of what they've done, tell them that in advance. Mm -hmm. Tell them that, listen, I want to know what's going on. I want to be invested in your activity and I want to be here to help you, but I need to know that I'm getting a return on my money. So then you can do the whole entrepreneur thing and say, listen, this is my baby it's my money, and I want you to trust it as if it were yours, but I'm not going to give you equity, so I'm really kind of full of crap, and I'm going to hold you accountable before we start. <laughs> I love that. I will use that exact wording. <laughs> totally. So how? So it, weekly, uh, weekly email summary or something like that, should we be giving them specific metrics? Like what if they're brand new and they don't really know the space? Like well, I what think training? Really depends, you know, if you're talking about a salesperson, if you're talking about an executive assistant, if you're talking about an HR person or a finance person, you know, if you, again, you need to like the person and you need to be able to say, we want to have, you know, we use in our terminology, right, a, a come to Jesus meetings or, or a brutal truth meeting. Meeting where you sit down and say to somebody, listen, this is the positives of working with you. This is the negatives. This is what I'm, I'm getting from you. But metrics are, if it's a sales mentality, how many meetings are you having in a week? How many orders are you getting? Are you delivering on the orders? What's the, what's the follow-up? When people don't want to share that information with you, it always rubs me wrong. Right. It's kind of like I, I, I tend to be a pretty open book. So it's to me, it's the, the essence of when people say, oh, I won't take a drug test for the constitutional value. I was go, you're going to be a difficult person to manage. Right? <laughs> Someone says to me, I want you to take a drug test. I go, sure. OK, because I got nothing to hide. Right. And if somebody doesn't want to communicate what they're doing in their job to you and you're their employer, why is that? Why wouldn't they want to share what they're doing with the woman or man that's paying them? Why would they not want to share that? 
Heck yeah, that makes perfect sense. You're like, okay, you're hiding something and then you're distrusting from them and that doesn't help with the relationship at all, right? All built on trust. Yeah, okay. So for like an executive assistant, which probably wouldn't have as easy as a metric, because a lot of people, their first hire is their executive assistant, right? And so what would what can they measure in regards to executive assistant side? I think the summaries at the end of the day of what they've done are great. So I, I have an executive assistant who's terrific, who's been with me for almost three years now. And I went through a ton of them in the beginning that were different. And so, um, and it was one of the last hires that I did. I had, I, I think in the beginning, it's almost better to not have one um, from the standpoint of you should have your hands in everything you're doing. Um, but when you do, it was a summary of what she was doing every day. Hmm. Just get, at the end of the day, because I wanted her to keep tabs for herself. So she could, I knew that she was organized and also so I could see where she was spending her time and be able to just look at it and say, you know what? I really wish you wouldn't have done that today. I pr- and then and you realize your communication stuff. She goes, well, you never told me that. Well, I, I learned a lot about myself. Oh, that's awesome. Tell me a little bit about what made a not good executive assistant from before and what makes this person a better executive assistant. So when somebody's like trying to hire their first hire, I how think, do they know? I think one of the, one of the biggest things I see in a, in any company, especially an entrepreneurial company though, is when an executive assistant doesn't have a peer group, it's a big challenge. So if you go to a big company, a, a fortune 500 company or things like that, there's a huge administrative pool. And so there's a, there's a peer group. When you have people that are all salespeople or all developers or, or what have you, and then you have one person who's an admin, they're not sure where they fit. Mm-hmm. And especially in an entrepreneurial, in a tech startup, I think you said you were in Austin, right? There's a lot of tech startups and things like that. Well, now all of a sudden, a lot of the, a lot of the, the coders and developers and architects, they're not the most type A social people. And so now you've got a social, more socially inclined administrative assistant and they're, yeah, it, it, it creates a very difficult and sometimes awkward situation. So I think to make sure you find somebody and you lay out how you like to work, it adds a lot of value. Okay. How do you do that? What if you are sort of an introvert, you don't want to talk to people and your executive assistant doesn't match with that? How do you know that they don't match? Well, again, you've got to be interviewing people and you've got to be sharing with them and say, I'm not a big talker. I don't want that type of relationship. However, you also, you're a leader, you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're, you're going to run a company. And you also have to realize you need to not only, it can't always be what you want. We're not all, Steve Jobs could always have what Steve Jobs wants because Steve Jobs was Steve Jobs, right? Tom Gimbel, Mary Smith, David, whatever. We're not Steve Jobs. So we need to learn to accommodate around some other people, even though we're paying the bills. And we need to be able to grow and expand our communication styles and our thought process and our personality because it'll make us better, better at what we do, not just to accommodate somebody, but we should want to grow and how to relate to people differently. And it it really is transferable to your clients. Huh. See, I thought you were the Supreme Commander. I thought you knew. (laughs) So, so when you You try to. Other person. (laughs) So when you're trying to like learn, go, okay, that's a, an issue that I have to work on. Yeah. Right. And you know that it's an issue. How do you fix that? Because we can read, you know, books about like changing attitudes or working with people and stuff like that. But it's harder to like implement it and get it right. Well, I think there's a lot of different things. There's professional coaches. I, I have a, a person that we refer a ton of companies to from a, a professional coach and development because they're going to hold you accountable to the changes. You're paying them money and they know that if they hold you accountable, you'll do them. If you do them, you'll like the results. There's even easier things, though. Around the country, there's groups called Toastmasters, which are public speaking engagements, which for the most part are free and or a small lunch that you have to pay for to do it. So there's a lot of things around um, becoming more... I don't know, gregarious for lack of a better word, or or more outspoken on certain issues and doing that. But it, it is it is a, a learned behavior. So somebody was asking, I just did a Periscope right before this, I was telling you that, and asking questions to them, because I really want to know what you guys want to ask too, not just, don't get me wrong, I love asking questions. Somebody was asking about outsourcing versus um, hiring, and can you mingle the two? Like if you have a couple employees is it weird? Does it affect your company culture if you outsource a lot of other tasks? 
Well, I think it's no different than anything else. Of, of There's some things around your house that you want to do on your own and fix it up. And then when you have to do landscaping and cutting the grass, you outsource that. doesn't mean you're outsourcing the whole house. You're still going to decorate it and paint the walls and pick the colors. But you're, you're allocating a chore, a responsibility. So with recruiting, you can outsource recruiting. You know, my firm does recruiting. Companies come to us. They say, find me A, B, and C. Then they interview A, B, and C. Mm-hmm. And then they make a decision on having them join their company. So outsourcing is a huge part of it. We should, you know, my firm belief on whatever you do is focus on what you do and outsource things as much as you can from a cost standpoint. And you, but you still need people to manage the process. If you're doing a a website, you still need a marketing person internally to manage that process. So there's a lot that goes into it. Okay, awesome. So having one person here in the States or or locally or whatever that can really you can really communicate with and manage and then they can do contractors or whatever. Do you suggest hiring people out like outsourcing, like actually hiring them? Or is it easier to just have them as contractors? No, I think for the most part, it's easier to have missed contractors on that if you're going to outsource the stuff. to br- If you're going to bring people in your office, there's got to be a time crunch and a time delay. But a lot of people don't have the management aspect, so they'll pay up on a, on a doer because they can work independently for having a manager who can then manage the people and such. So it's I, I, I truly believe it's not a one-size-fits-all. I don't think business is one-size-fits-all. I don't think people are one-size-fits-all. So you've got to figure out what what works for you and then manage your manage your own expectations. How do you hire a really amazing manager that really has their stuff together? How do you know that it's the right person? Wait until the recession hits and big companies lay off all the middle managers and hire one of theirs. <laughs> it, it, it is a good manager is probably one of the most undervalued commodities because they're not managing or leading huge groups of people. Their salary structure is a little bit lower than 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 directors, VPs, right? They're they're middle managers for a reason, um, but they're excellent at problem solving, at nurturing, and and for me. It's about getting references from the managers, not just from their superiors, but from their subordinates. What was it like working for Mary? What was it like working for Scott? And to find out those experiences to make sure you're bringing on the right people. But to also realize that, you know, for the most part, how big was the team? And if they have you talk to only one person out of 12 people, maybe there's one person that liked them. I I think you really have to um, a lot of behavioral or situational interviewing is helpful, um, but to realize that you've got to you've got to differentiate um, being sold a bill of goods and buying something that you're confident in, you know, the ingredients, so to speak. So, what's your hiring process like? Do you go through? I mean, I'm sure it's probably pretty rigorous on everything that you do with what you guys have learned. So, what sort of tips can you give us on that hiring process? I know you said talk to more people, but like step by step, what what should we be doing? Well, I think number one, you want to have somebody who is assigned to facilitate this person through the process. Might be the CEO if that's the case. Might be an admin. Might be, you know, a different person every month. But someone's got to own that communication process because if somebody's waiting a week or 10 days or two weeks just to hear that you're thinking about it, which is fine, they just need that communication. You should treat can internal candidates as potential clients. And how would you treat your client? How are you going to treat your candidates? Because you want to guide them through the process. You don't want to tell them how everything's going to go, but you want to guide them through the process. Then you want to have as many people on your team that, you know, from a time standpoint makes sense, meet with this candidate. If you're a startup and you've got a five, six person team, you should have people meet them because two things. Number one, you want everybody's buy-in on this. But number two, you don't want to alienate one of your good employees by not letting them be involved in the process. So you really accomplish two birds with, you really kill two birds with one stone. That's a key, key aspect on this. And then you want to go through, I'm I'm not a big believer in personality profiles or tests, but a lot of people are, and it's an easy way to take a gray issue and make it black and white. And so it can be more of a deciding factor and you can find a lot of, you know, disc tests fairly, uh, fairly affordable and online and relatively easy to do. And, And that makes sense. Um, And then what I like to do is is add in through the interview process some sort of social mechanism, whether it be a a coffee, a lunch, a happy hour. And depending on the level of the person, the the more I'll I'll invest from a time standpoint and do a dinner with uh, someone coming in who's going to be a direct report to me and and making go of it that way. Okay. Why don't you like personality tests? 
Um, I think that people don't always know. It, should my answer, am I supposed to answer this the way I think they want me to answer it? Am I supposed to answer it? You can't get past the first initial thought of, and I, I've done them, and, and, and I, I think they're accurate to an extent of, of, you know, are you dominant and all the other. I get it. I totally get it. And some, but I think there's also a gray area, too. Okay, that's interesting. So it's not, I mean, and that's the thing that's hard. People want data, but sometimes if they just go by that and don't go by all the other things. Yeah, I'm not completely against it. I'm just not, to me, it's not the deciding. I find it an interesting thing to do. I always think that if you're going to start doing profile tests on candidates, you should do it on your staff first, and then you have a benchmark. Well, that's what I was wondering, because how do you fit company culture? Do you do you just know innately or do you does your team know innately like this person's going to fit really well with all these other people? I think, you know, innately a little bit. I mean, there is a part to hiring, excuse me, from a culture standpoint, that is a little sorority fraternity ish. Right. You, you don't get that much time with people and you have to make an evaluation. And if they have a referral, which in, in the college world would be a, if they were a legacy, then they get a leg up on coming in and you do that. I, I think there is something to that to the hiring process. If you want to have that kind of culture where it's very um, pun intended, very collegial, that you're gonna you're gonna do that. I think it makes sense. Awesome. So once let's say you find somebody that is a great hire, or so you think, right? And you're like crossing oh, your fingers. Oh, always so you think. Exactly. Yeah. So normally I give like a 90 day trial or a 60 day trial or something like that. And then we train them. So tell me what that process looks like or what you recommend for a hiring them and then getting them up to speed. And do you do like a trial or something like that? Well, I mean, there's two ways to do it. The trial for us is if we do that, we bring people on temporary to permanent. So they're hourly before that we convert them over to salary. I think the, the 90 day trial period, I think everybody's on a trial period. And it's whether you tell people and how to me, it's more of a psychological expectations of management. So if you bring people in and you say you're on a 90 day trial period, a lot of times you can bring people in and on the 91st day they change. I made it, you know, put, put my hands up, right? I'm, uh, I got legs up on the desk. So I think you got to be careful with that a little bit and, and, and tell people what the expectations are, though, um, and how they're being viewed. I mean, to me, you're coming into a hard charging environment. You've got to realize that. The first few weeks, you, you know, it's a cliche. Cliches are cliches for a reason, because they're usually true. And you, you don't usually get a second chance to make a first impression. And that's what the 90 day window is. Those first three months are how people determine your work ethic, your sense of communication, your passion. Are you a talker? Are you knowledgeable? Are you a listener? So on and so forth. So when you're, when they're in that like 90 day trial, what do you guys use for processes in terms of training, especially for like a startup that doesn't have the documentation and the things that they should technically have like a big company? Yeah, I'd say more it's task oriented. So these are the accomplishments I want you to do. These are the people I want you to talk to on the phone. These are the things I want you to be able to checklist off. And, and the, the better the people don't have to be recruiters or HR professionals. They need to say in six months, what are my expectations? And write that down. Then work backwards and say, how can somebody have learned that by doing A, A, B, and C? Okay, you need to do A 10 times, B 10 times, C 10 times. You need to put thought into it. Superstars, you hire Michael Jordan, you're going to get great results no matter what. That's fine. Right. The fact of the matter is Scottie Pippen wasn't Scottie Pippen until he played with Michael Jordan and he was a, a late first round draft pick. You get you got to mold and choose people and figure out who I always say people learn more from anybody else. They learn more from the person they sit next to. Period. Right. The person they have the closest proximity to ask questions to and to listen to are the people that they learn the most from. Well. You know, you can only have a person on your right and your left. Right. So eventually you've got somebody sitting next to a weaker person. And when they're doing that, they're learning weak traits. Those are the challenges that you face. And you've got to make sure that you're offsetting that with exposure to other people that you view as good. How can you do that? Assuming that your team is pretty darn good, but there's always people that are lesser or maybe they are only a handful of people or maybe they don't. Maybe they all work virtually. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So like, how do we make sure that we do that? Well, I think when you're in a virtual world and you're if you're purely a development company or something along those lines, it's harder. You know, you're judging by the code that they write and auditing that code and making sure that that makes sense. 
Um, but I'm a big believer that I like people. I think a culture of change is a good culture. And you want people, everyone says, I love change. I love that. No, they don't. Major- it's against our human nature to love change, right? Even people who are anti-establishment, they like anti-establishment. They don't want change from anti-establishment. So it's everyone's full of crap a little bit, right? So I'm a big believer in moving people around for the sake of moving them around, moving desks around, moving offices, uh, moving responsibilities, because people need to ad- adjust adjust and adapt, and their brain needs to go from here to here and see what kind of thought process they have. That's really interesting. I've never heard of that, but it does make sense. Like we're even told, you know, don't keep taking the same route to work or to whatever oh. every single day because that change actually really helps. What have you find has been the benefit of doing that? Um, I think it's shaken out some people fairly early on that were a little rigid. And the other thing it does is it really gets people to be more malleable. I mean, they're just, they're easier going. It's not a big, I mean, I've seen people that they move desks five feet and it's a three day ordeal. And it's like, I got somebody else that, you know, they're, it's not, they do it in 15 minutes. Then you get somebody else who doesn't even clean off their desks for anybody else. They leave, like, it's like a moving sale. I mean, you gain a lot of knowledge on that by the consideration that people put into, into their stuff and their wares. And it's, uh, it's interesting. And so if you have like 5, 10, 15 people, how do you create the culture that you want? Because you've seen like Google and foosball tables yeah. and massages. Like, right. is that what it's about? Is it about communication? No, that's not what it's about at all. And I think people, yeah. people, now there's nothing, hey, Google could eat us all for lunch. They're a great company. And yeah. anybody who says otherwise, they're crazy. They're crazy. Same with Facebook. But what everyone has to realize is whether it's them or if a 15 person company, if somebody's feeding you dinner every night, it's because they don't want you to leave. Right. If they have a pool table, it's because they don't want you to leave. They have video games. They want you to stay where you're at. And I don't mean stay career wise. I mean, for the night, they want you there and working. And so you don't you can't talk work life balance at one place and um, foosball table free food all day at the at the same place. They they do that because they want you to be there. And it's a cycle. And it's great. It's a genius idea. And it works. And people want to be there. It's terrific. But what people really want is a sense of community. And whether you leave at five or six or midnight or whenever you leave is a sense of belonging, a sense of feeling that I'm going to get feedback, that I'm accepted for who I am, and that I'm encouraged to grow and develop. And if you can give those things on a regular basis, which is the part that's usually forgotten, it's not first day, six months, a year. It's every week, every month, every quarter. Feedback acknowledgement, participation. What do you say for like employee reviews and stuff like that? So it sounds like you have a whole process on this. So it's like not a, you know, it's not just, we have a quarterly review and we say 10 minutes and then we leave. So what is that process that you're working them through with the weekly and the, you know, that sort of thing? Well, first of all, when you only have meetings, when things are going badly, you're the grim reaper, right? So the first week you start, you need to have a one-on-one outside of the office or outside of your desk area in a, in a conference room or in a coffee shop and say, listen, every week or every other week at the latest, we're going to have a one-on-one that we have set. Some weeks it'll be my meeting, meaning I have the agenda. Some weeks it'll be your meeting, meaning you have the agenda. But we're going to spend a half an hour of time and we're going to talk about things, get to know each other, work through stuff, give assignments, get feedback. And sometimes they may need to have another one, a part two. Other times we're good. But if you do those on a consistent basis, they believe you're invested in them, which you are. And then when you have something bad or constructive criticism to give them, it's not coming out of left field. It's the number one thing to create the culture. It is. Number one thing. Okay. That's really interesting because you also hear other people are like, meetings, let's just get some stuff done and not have a bazillion meetings of everybody sort of talking about their stuff. They're right, and they're 100% correct. The, the issue isn't meetings. The issue is the efficiency of meetings. And why are we having it? What do we need to do? And do we have the right people included? A lot of times they'll have the wrong people included, and they'll let them drag on too long. And the key is to have the right people. And to, Now, there's also another reason to have a meeting. It's a culture creator. I want misery loves company. I want this person that's having a hard time to know this person's also having a hard time. And let's get together and have a good cry for 15 minutes and talk about it. And people appreciate that. That's a, it's it's a, it's a very strong synergy. Okay. And that's a good thing. So you want to get those people, even if they're complaining together and not like keep the complainers 
you know, in their respective corners or anything like that. Well, think about this. If complainers are the enemy, mm-hmm. right? I don't want them coming in from two separate ways. That's harder to fight. <laughs> I want them together coming at me so I can take the battle head on. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, what do you do with that? Like, let's say we've got, let's say we've got somebody with an attitude that's not great, but they're doing their job okay, but their attitude's not great. No, what? they're not. They're not. You just made the biggest management faux pas there is. If their attitude's not great, they're not doing their job okay. Mm. Okay, how do you know if they're, if it, they're just going through something? Right, because there you are people. Told, you told me the attitude wasn't good. Well, no, but 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 so I when okay, let me ask you this because the thing is that when I get feedback from people, sometimes they're like they were really good, and then their attitude seemed to change, and you're sort of going, well, is it something that they're going through at home? Like these are sort of all these totally. questions that are coming. So yeah, is no. it a temporary, or is it like a, oh my gosh, get rid of them because they're not doing well, their if, job? If you like your employee and they like you, then they should be sharing with you what's going on at home. And if you're perceptive to their attitude change then you want to talk about that with them. And that's part of those one-on-ones I'm talking about. It's not Mm -hmm. just about, hey, listen, we love you. I I believe there's two things that you gauge an employee on, right? Results, Mm -hmm. productivity, and attitude. And my feeling is that both can never be down at the same time. Ah, interesting. Okay. You never want... If you're if you're if you're going through a divorce, your grandma's sick, whatever the situation is, and your attitude's in the toilet, then your activity and your productivity better be darn high. Okay, because right? if it it's isn't, not, yeah, go ahead. Not, well, if it's not, why do I have you? You're 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 a, you're a complaining, no good culture sucker, but you you and you're you don't add any any revenue or productivity. Why are you here? Why do I want you? Okay, well, this goes perfectly into the how do you fire someone? Because <laughs> I've fired people. It can be ridiculously difficult uh, to fire someone, it, and nobody it, really likes to do it. It it should you should hate doing it. <laughs> you should hate fire. If you don't hate firing somebody, you've got a you've got a genetic problem. Okay, you're a descendant from uh, Attila the Hun, right? You're 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 <laughs> you're bad. Firing people's not fun um, because it's their lives. And, and now. Is it? A, I can be a relief if you've got somebody who's not giving their all. It's a relief because you don't have to worry about that problem anymore. But you want a termination to be simple, to the point. Move on. You know, you you want to bring him in and say, David, have a seat. Want to let you know I'm going to cut through the the BS. We're letting you go today. We feel we need to make a change. If you think they're a good person, you can say that. If you think it's not the right fit, you can say that. But say, we feel we need to go in a different direction. I don't want to hold this over your head any longer. I just wanted to be upfront, adult to adult, let you know we're making a change. Okay. It's when they beat around the bush in circles and circles and circles, and then they go. And it's because of the way you talked to Brian on Thursday, and it's because of the way you came in late on my – why? Why Why do you need to, to throw dirt on the grave after you've already made the decision to fire them? Yeah, some people over talk because they want to like like make them know that this is their fault, not your fault. Yeah, themselves. They're saying, if I can explain to you why I'm letting you go, then maybe you'll understand why I have to be a jerk and do this. Yeah, right. You're already doing it. It's fine. They're going to think what they think. Awesome. So then, what's the procedure after that for somebody who's new to the firing process? Is it like change passwords right away? Like, give me the process that that you should go through after. Yeah, you want to you want to make sure that you got to ask them for keys to the office. You got to ask them for the security badges. You got to, but you address. You go listen. Now I got to do that. If that wasn't bad enough, I got to do the uncomfortable stuff. And I'm sorry I have to do this, but you know, there's horror stories about this, and I just got to run the same the same thing gambit on everybody. So I need your keys and your security badge. We got to go if you can unload your briefcase and take out any company stuff that you have. And uh, and if you, what do you, is there anything you have at home that might be of company property? Okay, great. Walk them back to their desk. Let them give them a little bit of dignity, and then uh, take them to the door. Move on. And then go like this. No. Uh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. So can you tell me a little bit about your transition? Like, how did you get into staffing and recruiting? I was, uh, the, 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 the story goes, I was recruited into it. So, um, I had a friend from college that was in the, in the business and had a small startup going and he needed a sales guy and, and he recruited me to join him and, and, and I came on board and, um, you know, the rest is, is, is so on and so forth is history. But it was, uh, I, I, I had no idea. I was 26 years, 24 years old, but I, 
I didn't know. Oh, I want to do sales in a staffing and recruiting company. I didn't know. Um, but the aspect of every company needs people is a huge selling point. I mean, it's the one thing that every company needs. Yeah. And most people aren't very good at it either. So, and, and it's costly if they're not good at it. So therefore, it makes perfect sense that they'll hire you. Exactly. Hmm. I used to get jobs all the, all the time that way. I, I apply. I remember way back when I worked in tech. I applied yeah. to this company like four times. They did not care about my resume. As soon as I got a staffing agency to say how awesome I was, they hired me in two seconds and then hired right. three of my friends. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, so you guys, like I really appreciate everything that you do. How long have you had the company? Uh, oh, a little over 17 years. Wow. So what made you start your own? So you're in that space already. What made you actually start this? Well, they were going through a transition. They were preparing to sell the company. So it was a divestiture and different people and emotions and egos and things like that. So I had two job offers from other companies to, to get involved with them in a leadership role. Uh, it was a different world in the late 90s. And, and I was able to, to get the capital together to do this without um, going into debt or taking private ownership or uh, taking outside interest in the in the company. And we had had a really great run and I had proven to be pretty successful at it. So it was, it seemed to make sense at the time, but it was more happenstance than anything else. So you had never really run a company like this before. Did it just start with you as a solopreneur or did you already have people around you? No, I had two other people that I hired to work with me. One was with me and the, one, one lasted about six months and the other one lasted about nine years. Really? Okay. What yeah. was the difference between the two? Uh, well, one was uh, younger in her, in her early 20s and didn't have a college degree, which I knew when I hired, I wanted a college degree on people. And I, I, bent, I, 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 I bent the rule a little bit and it bit me. And the other one was uh, somebody I'd worked with for about six months previously in a different place and uh, didn't know him intimately, but um, thought he could add value as more. He was older than me, too, as more of a gray haired type of uh, individual kept him around for nine years, but probably, you know, the welcome started to wear out probably about year seven. Oh, interesting. Were you able to, at that time, I know you said you had some cash, but you probably were trying to keep it as lean as you could. How could you sure. pay? Did you pay them like what the standard was or did you try and get them less or how did that work? No, I paid them pretty competitively. I got a loan from the bank based against my, the, the equity that I had. And, and so I had, I had some funds to, to make payroll and do those things, but you're right. We were extremely lean, extremely lean. And it may have played a role in, in the type of person that I hired. Interesting. Okay. Give us some tips on, especially at the very beginning, because you've been through this before, yeah. right? How do you grow? Because if you're the guy and you only have a handful of people and you're trying to grow as fast as you, or not as fast, but you yeah. know, as much as you possibly can, because that's what everyone does. Give us some tips on managing that and dealing with the overwhelm. Well, I'll tell you, I, 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 it's ironic because the other day I was, I gave a presentation to my company. We do a quarterly kickoff meeting and we just, we, we just kicked off the fourth quarter, even though we're ahead of schedule. And I was looking at, at different speeches and interviews of different people. And I read Elon Musk's and it was mm. addressed to, or I watched Elon Musk and he's crazy awesome. Right. Yeah. But it was, he said, if you're doing a startup, you work a million hours. And he said, uh, we actually put couches in our office because we slept at the office and I coded and I ate and I coded and I ate. And I think that there's a lot to that is if you're going to do this and start it up and, you know, in that you want to make millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? And you want to grow this. Why wouldn't you invest all the time that you have into it? And, and I think that's the, the number one thing is you're trying to carve out time. There is no, you know, people go, oh, I still need me time to recharge the batteries. It's like, you know what? You're missing the boat. You are missing the boat. You are living in me time. Right. If this isn't your me time, if you don't feel that this is me time for the first four, five, six, seven, eight years, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah, you better love what you do. Well, let me ask you this, though, because when I started when I started this business, um, I had two small kids. Right. Well, uh, and so I only wanted to work 20 or 30. Why, thank you. They're six and eight now, so they're they're not oh. little anymore. Uh, but when I started this eight years ago, I had a baby, right? And I didn't want to work very much. So I was working 20, 30 hours a week, which was not good for an overachiever because I wanted to see massive growth, but I couldn't work very much. So I was frustrated in sort of both well, ways. My own, and I say this because I'm a sem word semantics geek, mm -hmm. right? At that point in time, you stopped becoming an overachiever. <laughs> Ouch. No, I was. I was an overachiever mom. <laughs> but you're exactly right. 
A hundred percent correct, right? But that that's what it comes down to. It's looking in the mirror and answering the tough questions. Mm-hmm. Am I really giving this all I have? Am I really giving this all I have? And yeah. you have to be able to say, no, I'm not. And I'm okay with slower growth. And I'm o- there's a give and a take for everything. Yeah, that's what that's what was so difficult for me trying to do that though, because I I was I always expected massive results because I'd always gotten massive yep. results. And then when I put my priority as my children, which makes sense, right? Uh, I was like, well, shoot, I can't, I, I couldn't have both like and I wanted. There's nothing wrong with raising a family. There's nothing wrong with volunteering at the church or temple or mosque. or and There's nothing wrong with any of it. You just have to realize you've shifted your priorities and, and the other things are going to pay a price, which isn't a bad thing. That's what happens with priorities, right? But it's slower and I had to deal with that. That was a pain. Dips. I mean, if you, <laughs> If everything could be balanced all the time, there'd never be any problems in the world. It's just not, that's not the way it is. So what do you think about balance in general, especially for running a company and, and that sort of thing? Now you have a huge team. Do you I don't still work? It. Do you still yeah, work? I work or... all the time. <laughs> but you love it, I'm assuming, right? I love it. Yeah. yeah. I don't, um, I think uh, balance is on a year, not on a day, a week or a month, right? So if at the end of the year, you look back over it and you say, uh, I was at my. I had. I was never missed a kid's birthday party. I was there for my anniversary. Um, uh, we took a vacation in the summer, and I got a day off at Christmas. And um, we took a couple three day weekends, and I got promoted, and my team hit goal, and I made more money than I ever made before. That's a balanced year. Does it mean that on Thursday evening that you're working until midnight that you really feel balanced? No, but I got to tell you. You can be home and be in love with somebody and you look in the mirror when you're fighting or they're picking their toenails in bed and you want to cut their throat. And guess what? You're not in love then either. And balance is at the moment you have more than one kid, you don't have balance. Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) When one kid's got a soccer game and one kid's got a piano recital, you got to pick which one. You pick the kid you love the most, right? I mean, that's what you do. (laughs) Which changes every single day. And what I always say is you've got to view your career when you're when it's more established, you got to view your career as a kid, mm. meaning just don't always neglect that kid. Sometimes that kid, that work has to come first over your children, because in the end of the day, I was interviewing a guy once and he said, I want to be a great dad. I want to be at all of my daughter's ballet recitals. I want to be there all the time. I go, I have no problem with that. You have to figure out if being a great dad means being at every ballet recital when they're four or send, being able to afford to send them to Princeton when they're 18. Hmm. Your decision, not mine. I'm okay with whatever you do. You just may not be able to do it here. You can't do both, you don't think? I think there's, hey, there's a situation that works for everybody. I'm telling you that the one situation that usually never fails is work ethic and time commitment. And if you put in six, if I put in 60 hours a week and I'm just as smart as you and you put in 40 hours a week, I'm 50% ahead of you. I know, man, I have a client. She was, she works 20 hours a week and I had another client who worked about 80 hours a week. She's like, how come he's going so much faster? I'm like, he's doing four times what you are. (laughs) Like there's not, it's not hard to figure out. Right. And so you just have to be okay with the consequences. And someone says, well, I'm being penalized because I want to be a parent. No, you're not. The other guy's being rewarded because he works more. Hmm. Well, and it's your choice to be a parent, and it's, it's a good thing to be, yeah. Absolutely. You just can't move as fast in other things. The, the biggest problem I see is that everyone wants to criticize the other party. Hmm. You want to be a full-time mom or a part-time? Good. That's awesome. Live with the consequences. <laughs> you want to not be at home as much and be a career person? Live with the consequences. It's it's just living with your own your own responsibilities. It's okay. Do you think every everything has consequences? So there's nothing that we can do that we can't sort of figure out both. I think everything has con everything has you, everything. It's a, it's called a give and a take, action and a reaction. That's awesome. Oh man, we have to start wrapping up. But uh, <laughs> this is such, such an interesting conversation. One of the reasons why I started uh, Millionaire Interviews was to ask these questions. Yeah. And one of the things that I brought on when I did a survey of all the millionaires at the very beginning was how many hours at the beginning of their company did they work? And I didn't, it was just a blank. And, and <laughs> the most common answer was all of them. And I was like, crap, I'm only working 20 hours a week. Everybody else is like, all of them. That's and it's fun. true. It's true, though. I'm assuming it's true for you, right? Do you work all of them I at the beginning? I work more now than I work then. Really? Why? Uh, I have more responsibility. Interesting. But that means you could have worked harder earlier, though, huh? For sure I could have. Huh. Absolutely. Why didn't you? Uh, I didn't, wasn't smart enough. <laughs> 
I'm smarter now than I was then. That's, well, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> I, I think the most successful people in the world tend to work more. Right? It's different kinds of work, mm. right? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg or 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 uh, um, Elon Musk or whatever they're doing. They're not writing code anymore, maybe, but they're traveling more. I mean, when they're on a plane and they're flying to D.C. to talk to the Congress and they're going to Europe to talk, they're, that's work. Mm. That's work. And maybe you tie in trips on the back end or the front end, or you. But they're they're working more on different things, on bigger picture things. The most right. The president of the United States works more as the president of the United States than he did when he was a state senator for Illinois. Mm. It's just how it is. Do you, before I get to my last question, do yeah. you think that, like, give me some tips on handling overwhelm and stuff like that? Because I get a lot of people coming in that are running around like chicken with their head cut off. Yeah. Right. And they're like, I am, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm trying to work 90 breathe, hours breathe, a week. Breathe, write, and don't buy into the stereotypes. Ooh. Right. So okay. breathe, meaning the world is not going to end because you don't get X done. It's just not. Breathe. Right. And then don't buy into the stereotypes of I'm an entrepreneur, so everything's going to be like this. Mm -hmm. Everything is the way you want it to be. And again, you make decisions and you get rewarded or penalized based on those decisions. Really, really important. And work hard. I mean, I've never seen things that can't be fixed with hard work and honesty and communication. Own what you say you're going to do. That's awesome. Okay, so the last question. What's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Save more than you spend. That's awesome. Okay, elaborate because we know – I know it's a cliche and you know you just said that that's exactly why people say it because it's extremely important. But how do you do it? Well, I think number one, the, the more money you're making, the more you have to live on what you used to make. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing as you, as you accumulate. And I'm not even talking individually as a corporation. You want your company to have a strong balance sheet. And if you're spending money all the time for your own personal lifestyle, taking out of the company, you're weakening your company and you're weakening your lifestyle. So to create an asset that's, that's seven figures plus, you need to be financially sound and think, I don't really need everything. I don't need everything today. And, and that, that goes a long way to um, moving forward on that. The other thing is focus on short-term goals, right? You got to get the 50,000 and 100,000 and a quarter of a million and a half a million and a million. And then you get there and then you have a catastrophe and you need to spend money and liquefy, uh, liquidate some, some assets. There's a million things that, that go on. The key is you can't, it, it's very, very difficult to make a lot of money, to earn a lot of money without working your butt off. It's very difficult. I hope everybody's super excited to like go work their butts off right now. Where can we find out more uh, information on you? Tell us your website where we can contact you. So you can get us at LaSalleNetwork.com, L-A-S-A-L-L-E Network.com. And if you want to know about what I do during the day, which probably isn't that stimulating to most, <laughs> um, you can follow me on Twitter at Tom Gimbel and you most likely see a lot of Cubs, Cubs mentions on that. So, uh, <laughs> as we awesome. like to say in Chicago, hashtag uh, world series 2015. <laughs> So you don't work all the time. No. <laughs> I'll try to take clients with me to the game. I killed two birds so with one. So smart. Oh. So smart. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Tom. I really, really appreciate it. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want more like it, go to eventualmillionaire.com. If you click on the millionaire case studies, you will see over 200 millionaire interviews. I don't want you to get overwhelmed, of course, but I do want you to pick the one that might make the biggest difference in your business today. So what's something you're struggling with and take a look and see if one of those could specifically help you. Don't just take information for information's sake. I want you to be able to take the information, have it applicable to you right now. You use it, you take action, you see results, you come back and go, Jamie, that was amazing. That's what I want. So go check out eventualmillionaire.com and click on the millionaire case studies. Thanks.